<clears throat> is this the week that I said I'd do a thing that I've forgotten? What thing? Do you remember? The Jerry Anderson Podcast with Jamie Anderson, Richard James and Chris Dale. It's the Jerry Anderson mm-hmm. Podcast, Pod 278. Mm. We're here celebrating the 40th anniversary of Terror Hawks, which, if you're watching this on the day of release, was today, the 9th of October in 1983. Well done. See? You're so knowledgeable. I'm on it. You? I'm on it like a car bonnet. And to celebrate, we've got a very special guest joining us later on. Uh, don't, no, don't spoil it. Oh. Yeah. In the meantime, who are you? What are you doing here? Well, hmm. um,. Shortly after uh, Terror Hawks yes. uh, was created, yes. I was created. <laughs> okay. So it's not my 40th anniversary. No, uh, not yet. No, we'll be, we'll be in, a, in a couple of years' time. Mm. Uh, no, uh, so I'm Jamie Anderson. I see. Uh, another creation of Jerry Anderson. I see. I hadn't really thought of you in those terms before. A Jerry, you are quite literally a Jerry Anderson production. Uh, yes, I am. A bit <laughs> weird. I don't, I'm not really sure I like being referred to as that. Well, 14 years before Terror Hawks was brought kicking and screaming into the world. Yes. I was brought kicking and screaming into the Brilliant. world. And I'm Richard James. Amazing. Uh, star of Space Precinct. Star? Uh, I, literally, I was the star of the show. Really? In my own mind, I was, yes. Right. Yeah, yeah, I was going to say. <laughs> Ted, Ted Shackleford might have something to say about that, I would say. Well, yeah, but he's not here, so it doesn't matter. Yes, if they're not here to oh, defend what themselves, a shame. then who cares? What a shame. Ted Shackleford, you know, he's one on the list that if we could get him in for an interview, that would be absolutely amazing, but... Unlikely, isn't it? Very unlikely, I'm afraid yeah, to say. That yeah. is a shame, yeah. It is a shame. But anyway, yeah. uh, well, we had a nice weekend of the Terror Hawks weekend. Uh, yes, wasn't that fun? And the release of the Terror Hawks beer. Brilliant. Who would have thought there'd be that. a Terror Hawks beer? Oh, yeah. Uh, Great. We can talk more about that later or, or, I'm or try saying, some. If you want to order some, you can go to Brew York. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, search Brew York on, on Google and they're brewyork.co.uk and you yeah. can buy cans of Terror Hawks 40th anniversary beer. Brilliant. It's lovely. Yeah. It's got a lovely mouthfeel to it. Yes. Quite malty. Hoppy. Mouthfeel. Mouthfeel. That's one of the characteristics of beer, isn't it? Oh, is it? Okay. Yeah, sweetness, Fine. mouthfeel. Right. Hoppy, uh, bitter. Okay. Um, All right. So it's a bit like the Jerry Anderson podcast. We've got the mouthfeel of Fab Facts. We've got the sweetness of Jerry Anderson News. We've got the, the hoppy flavours of the Podstroms, who've been emailing us in at uh, uh, podcast at jerryanderson.com. Yeah. We've got the froth of the randomizer. Oh, you can say the bitterness. That's better than you want oh, yes. the froth. Oh, yes. No, no, no. Because now I'm left with bitterness for our star guest interview and that doesn't seem right oh, does it no what about right. the nutty tones of john lee visual effects designer from terror hawks who will be joining us for the first part of an interview with chris dale he might not be joining us after that introduction but <laughs> i'm sure he's looking forward to having a chat to chris <sighs> which would mean that you're the sparkle right and the fizz and i'm the flat bit that you get left at the bottom of the glass uh, that's 10 percent saliva oh Wow. You're the backwash. The Jerry Anson podcast backwash. Richard James. There you go. I've been called worse. Right. Well, <laughs> I mean, we've definitely sold this podcast. Yeah. Happy birthday, Terror Hawks. Oh, oh yeah. Happy birthday, Terror Hawks. <laughs> wow. Okay. Well, um, yes. you've done all the intro stuff. I have. We've talked about Terror Hawks beer. Yes. Uh, should we just go straight to Fab Facts? Yeah, go on. Fab Facts. Looking forward to this. Now, time for this week's Fab Facts. Uh, why are you looking forward to Fab Facts so particularly? This well, week? because I like the fact that it's early in the podcast. Get it out of the way. And then we can sit back and enjoy the rest of the uh, of the, uh, the the show. So, just out of interest, when you have your uh, uh, you know Sunday roast or a meal of any sort, yeah, do you eat it in Brussels sprouts first? The order of least favourite to favourite. Yeah, you don't mix things together. You and don't do you know what's last? Oh, I don't know what cranberry sauce. Just a spoonful of cranberry sauce. Yeah, I leave sauce. that on my plate till last because it's so, my favourite bit. What's that? Is that Chris? Is, is the randomizer your your, ran, your cranberry sauce? I hadn't really thought of it in those terms. Cra- You're randomizer. now equating the Jerry Anderson podcast with the Sunday lunch. <laughs> We've already <laughs> I think that's better done the than beer. The beer. Anyway, yeah. right. This is Fab Facts, <clears throat> right? Uh, which Richard loves. Yes, like he loves Brussels sprouts. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> that's about right. Uh, so I have a, a Sproutalicious book of Fab Facts. Mm-hmm. Never used that. I'd Overcooked, I would say. Yeah, all right. Yeah. Slightly sort of eggy whiff. Yeah. Yeah. And I flick through the pages. Richard shouts, Fab. Yeah. And then, um, yeah, there's a, there's a Fab Fact here. Yeah, that's it. Probably. Yeah. That... Well, come on, then. All right. Come on. <sighs> here we go. All right. Fab! 
stopped I'm looking on very the page. carefully. I'm looking very carefully. I've stopped on the page. <laughs> okay. Ah, there you go. Oh, you'll like this one. Oh, good. It starts all sort of, you know, thespian -y. As Shakespeare once said... Oh, yes. Go on, guess. Well, to be or not to be? No. Uh, all the world's a stage? No. Uh, what's in a name? <laughs> Spot on. Oh. Nailed it. As Shakespeare once said, what's in a name? Yes. Well... It's a question that many people uh, associated with the world of Jerry Anderson might well have asked themselves. Right. And the answer might have been... Yes. Not much. Hey. Uh, judging by how many different ways their names appeared on screen or in print. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, it's common for writers to use pseudonyms in their work. Yes. Have you ever used a pseudonym? I haven't yet, no. Okay, but one maybe in the future. Uh, okay. To distinguish a, a series from another they may have written, yeah. or even to absolve themselves of any responsibility once the show hit the air. Oh, which is what I would do. That's the only uh, situation I think I'd use a really? pseudonym. Oh, that looks rubbish. Can we just not credit me? Thank you. Or credit you under your other name? Yes. Hubble Orion? <laughs> yes, no one would ever know. That'll do the job. Uh, sometimes it's simply that a writer might want to distinguish one genre in which they write from another. Yeah. For example, writer, director and podcast guest Stephen Gallagher huh? yes. uses the name John Lidecker yes. for his Doctor Who novelization of his own script, mm -hmm. Warriors Gate. True enough. Yeah. Why did he do that? I don't know. I didn't ask him when he was on the show. Should have done. Foolish. Sorry. Foolish. Uh, in the Jerry Anderson universe, John Peel, author of The Stingray Files, mm -hmm. wrote novelizations based upon episodes of the 1990s TV series James Bond Jr. Right. Uh, under the pseudonym John Vincent. Oh, okay. And if you're a fan of the John Thaden Stingray and Thunderbirds novels, you'll be interested to hear that his real name was John W. Jennison. Uh, but he also wrote under the names Jill Hunt, Gil Hunt, yeah. and King Lang. King Lang. Interesting. A weird one. Yes. Anyway, when Dad decided to discontinue his association with legendary composer Barry Gray... Uh, Barry continued to compose independently, sometimes using the pseudonyms John Livesey, Livesey? Right, Livesey, I think, yes. Gene Durant. Right. And Martin Gerburg, a character in the TV series Bergerac. This is going to mean nothing again to our international <laughs> listeners. Right. What was Bergerac? Well, well do you know what Bergerac was. I know, was. 1980s... Uh, yes, uh, John Nettles, detective set on the island of Jersey. Yeah. Yeah, classic car. Louise Jameson. Yes. I'm just saying random words now. name, yeah, okay. <laughs> However, the king of the pseudonym has to be Tony Barwick. Oh, yeah. Between 1966 and 1986, Barwick was credited with scripts of no fewer than 103 individual episodes. For wow, days, really? Making him uh, the most prolific collaborating writer. Uh, but not all of them featured his name in the credits. Perhaps it's a mark of quite how successful a writer he was that he could comfortably choose joke pseudonyms for his work, as he did with uh, his episodes of Terror Hawks. Oh, I hope we hear some. Have you got some there? Uh, yes. Come on, then. Uh, here are a few of the best. Yes. Tom and Jerry Stein. Tom and Jerry Stein, right, Tom yes. And, Tom Good. and Jerry. Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, Claude Backstein. Right. Claude Back. Yeah. Fred Bearstein. Fred Threadbear? Thread, Threadbear, Fred, yeah. yeah. Fred Bearstein. Pseudonymstein. <laughs> Clever. Pseudonym, yeah. obviously. Uh, Cougarstein. Cougar. Cougar. Okay. Frank Instein. Oh, yeah, obviously. Frank Instein. Tom Katstein. Oh, it's very feline-based, well, isn't it? Obviously. Tom yes. 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 Uh, Leo Pardstein. Here we go, right. I mean, that's brilliant. Yeah, okay. Uh, and uh, Manny Feekstein. Manny Feek. <laughs> I like that's, it. That's good, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, and the one that brings us full circle back mm. to the very beginning of this fan fact, if you remember. I do. Shakespeare style. Oh, I see. Wow. Very good. Gosh. So, as well as being one of our most prolific writers, I guess you could say that Tony Barwick really made a name for himself. Uh, <laughs> Who writes this Ah, uh, great. Interesting. Yeah, mm. pseudonyms are interesting, aren't they? I don't think I've ever used one. Or, I can't see... I did think of using my middle name once as nice my writing. <laughs> yes, that's right. That would be great. It you would be do good, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but, but didn't, obviously, so yeah, that's not that much of a story. That doesn't bother you. <laughs> that's great. That's, yeah, that's I thought of something once. Did not. That's an anecdote, isn't it, basically, <laughs> uh, which you've just done there. Uh, yeah. I mean, you don't consider doing different names for your historical type no, too fiction late. versus your... Well, too late, isn't it? 
We could go back and republish them on the I could names. do that, yeah. yeah. No? Okay, fine. I might, I, in fact, I might choose the name Jamie Anderson, see how that goes. Really? Make yes. sure you're doing your best work. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. No, the dross, the dregs, the bits I found at the bottom drawer, I'll publish that as Jamie Anderson. Brilliant. I could sully your brand. Thanks so much. Well, because I get uh, accredited with saying that lovely thing about grief. Oh, right. Which has nothing to do with me. Oh, I don't know if you've seen that. No. Attributed to me. Right. Yeah. And of course, and I get attributed to having invented the slinky. Yes, of course. Nothing Congratulations that. on that. That wasn't me. You must be rolling in it. No, I say it wasn't me. Oh, sorry. Actually, I wouldn't be rolling in it. I'd be sort of, uh, you know, flopping downstairs. Flop, yeah. yeah, well, that sounds more like you. Yeah. Anyway, mm. that brings us, I think, yes. rather clunkily, to the end of this week's... Fab um, Fackstein! Oh. You didn't even try anything. No, but I was going to go for name, well, why name didn't you then? fact. Because you'd already said fab, and then I thought, what the next are you doing now? <sighs> You're watching slash listening to the Jerry Anderson podcast. It's essentially where Jamie and I bicker for about an hour. The, yeah, the Jerry Anderson bicker cast. Can, yeah. we, can we just say consuming the Jerry Anderson podcast? Oh, I don't like that. that what, what else? What's a, what's a good word for listening and or watching then? Enjoying? Yes. <laughs> we can't guarantee yes. that they're enjoying you this. You are enjoying the Jerry Anderson podcast. We know you are. And how do we know uh, you are? Because you email us and tell us. Allegedly, yeah. And we'll be reading some of those emails out a little later on. Oh, yeah. Can't wait. Um, but mm. I'm getting itchy again. And that can only mean one thing. <laughs> Run out the cream, yeah. yeah. It's time for. Uh, uh, Jerry Anderson News? Yes! Thank goodness for that. Right, Jerry Anderson News. Hello there, Anderson aficionados. It's Jamie Anderson here once again with your weekly roundup of everything happening in the wonderful worlds of Jerry Anderson. Let's jump right in. First up, a monumental shout out to Terror Hawks on its 40th anniversary. For all of you who grew up in the excitement of the 1980s, we've got a treasure trove of delights just for you. From the official soundtrack, complete with a special 40th anniversary slipcase exclusive to the Jerry Anderson store, to the comic anthology and of course the all-encompassing making of book we've got you covered oh and let's not forget that brand new graphic novel deep blue z but we're not done yet stay tuned tomorrow that's 10 10 for a very special terror hawks day live stream it all kicks off at 7 p.m on the jerry anson youtube channel and we've got a pretty major announcement that i think you won't want to miss also cheers to terror hawks we've partnered with brew york for a very special collaboration, introducing the official Terror Hawks 40th anniversary beer. But remember, it's a limited edition, so get yours exclusively through Brew York's website, or if you're in York, swing by one of their bars. And for those of you who love to delve deep into our universe, Spectrum Issue 2 is officially out now. Journey through the new adventures from Terror Hawks, New Captain Scarlet, and Space Precinct. Don't miss out, grab your copy today. Space 1999 fans, brace yourselves. We've restocked some classic model kits and they're flying off our shelves faster than the Eagle Transporter escaping the moon's orbit. Whether you've been pining for a stun gun and comlock or the iconic Eagle or the sleek Hawk, act fast, they won't be in stock for long. Well, that wraps up this week's news. Please stay passionate, stay inspired, and as always, remember, let's keep the magic of Jerry Anderson alive. Oh, and uh, a little nudge for you, Richard. I think we should bring back the That Was The News song, shall we? It's been sorely missed. Until next time, everyone. That was the news. That was the news. Ah, oh, there we are. Thank you to Specky, Jamie, for reminding me. Yeah, be still my beating heart. It's so if, lovely to hear you sing that again. If indeed he did remind me. Well, you did it, so he must have done, whether it was in voice or not. So. <laughs> Great. Love a bit of Jerry Anson news, and the itch just goes immediately. It's funny. It's, it's a real it's quite calming tonic like, ointment, isn't it? It is. It's an ointment, an unction. <laughs> this is the voice of the Podsterons. Talking of ointments and unctions... <laughs> Come on! Some of our podstrums are so quick on their keyboard sending us emails that they get repetitive strain injury and have to put, like, stuff on their hands. Friction burns like, to, yeah, their, to yeah. their fingers, right? Yeah, because they send us emails to podcast at jerryanderson.com and we read them out. Now, right. it's quite a long one here. Do you want to take it or shall I? I, I? I can take it if you like. Go on, then. Uh, this is John. Yes. John says... Strap in. Hello. He didn't say that. As Richard <laughs> no. said that. He says, hello, gents. Hello. I have to apologise in advance for the lengthy email. I've got so much to say about this amazing interview. I see this is why you wanted me to read it, right? <laughs> ah, there's, a, there's, there's a pattern here, isn't there? 
I'm making my way through the early back catalogue of the podcast. Oh, yes. actually, it might be one of mine. Yes. Uh, as I hadn't found you all back then, mm-hmm. I was listening to Pod 29. Oh, all right. All the way wow. back on New Year's Eve 2019 with uh, Sean Feast. Amazing. Uh, author of A Thunderbird in Bomber Command. And I found it absolutely fascinating. It was fascinating yeah. because of Sean. Uh, and really struck me on several personal levels. I've instantly had to look up this book and get a copy, and I can't wait to read it. My great uncle, John Weatherly, was a pilot in the latter years of World War II, having joined the RAF in 1943, aged 18, straight out of high school. Mm -hmm. I was fortunate to get to sit with him to talk through his early life and his career for an assignment for uh, for school to write a biography of a family member. Yeah. Nice exercise, that one. Yeah, yeah. Listening to your interview with Mark about Lionel's early life, his flying training and his experiences through the war until his tragic death brought me back to my chat with my great uncle and discussing all those exact same things. He was posted to flight training in Alabama. Mm -hmm. Uh, Lionel was uh, in Arizona, obviously, so Mm -hmm. very similar. Um, And having been from the Scottish borders, it was a far off world from what he'd been used to. He eventually graduated onto flying Spitfires and Typhoons operationally latterly on the typhoon where uh, during a rocket attack mission he was shot down in belgium Uh only a few weeks after lionel had been posted missing in action so very close similar timeline there isn't it he was picked up by the belgian resistance and was smuggled home on a fishing boat and continued to fly until the end of the war. Wow. Extraordinary. That's a proper kind of hero's return, yes, isn't it? Yes, yes. His flying logbooks are still intact, and I have them still, which makes fascinating reading, uh, along with several letters to his parents while in the USA and during his operational time, and lots of photos. There's even a letter um, where he's confirmed missing in action. Ooh, wow. wow. Hmm. Uh, I grew up during the 1990s reruns of Thunderbirds, and this is where my personal interest in flying was sparked. And along with flying stories from my great uncle and my dad, uh, an American Army helicopter pilot in Vietnam, Hmm. it was inevitable that I would end up flying as well. I was unsuccessful at the medical stage applying to the RAF, so I went down the civilian route uh, and am now an Airbus captain based at Gatwick. Wow. Amazing. Great. A large part of my flying training took place in New Zealand, so I can appreciate Lionel's letters home uh, and living this whole new world. Thank you uh, to you all for keeping the Anderson world going. Like I say, Thunderbirds was where it started for me, quickly followed by Captain Scarlet and Stingray, and eventually Space Precinct, as I was just the right age to appreciate that when it was released. Excellent. And yes, Richard, Mm. Orin was my favourite character. (sighs) That's why I got you to read it out. Yeah, funny that. Um, I discovered UFO and the Secret Service earlier in the year, having somehow missed those, and I'm now obsessed with them too. Uh Uh, Hope to be listening for a long time to come. Cheers, John. John, we hope you are too. Yes, absolutely. That's great, isn't it? Yeah, wonderful story. See, all these kind of parallels with people's real lives and the ways they connect with the shows are amazing, I think. Yeah. It's not just, you know, I watched this as a kid, I had the toys, I enjoyed it. Sometimes yeah. things run much deeper and sometimes by surprise. Yeah, so thanks, absolutely. John, for sharing. What a lovely email. Thank you for that. Uh, a lovely one here from Simpsons Clips 24. Hello, Rich and Jamie. Hmm? From, we haven't heard from SC24 for a while, have no, we? No, no. It says, hello, Rich and Jamie. Simpsons Clips 24 here. Myself and a friend of mine were recently rereading a Terror Hawks annual... Uh, which is rather pertinent, isn't it? Yes. Um, when we notice something that I thought you two could help me with, Uh-oh. that normally presages Jamie saying, don't no. know. Yeah. Uh, the past few times where we've read it together, we've never noticed where it says next of kin in the character bios. Mm. This time, however, we did. Now, most of them are obvious. Neinstein, none. Mary, mother. Kate Kestrel, father. But then we get to Hawkeye. His next of kin is listed as code 8619 slash FF. This is where you two come in. Because what does that even mean? Well... I have actually got a quite in-depth answer for you here. <laughs> right, right. Uh, which is, mm. I've got no idea. Oh, Jamie. <laughs> Every time. <laughs> Poor sense of script. I can't know everything. I mean, I, yeah. I mean that's that's uh, bizarre, isn't it? I yes. Don't, I didn't think that uh, Headley Henderson was a, a sort of born to some secret okay. thing, but maybe it's a secret pilot father. Mm. If only Chris Dale were here to answer with all of his wisdom that he brings to these things. Yeah. I can't yeah. see him. No, he's not. Oh, no. oh, oh, he's there. He doesn't he know either. He doesn't know. No, <laughs> there you go. There's your answer. Uh, nobody knows because yeah. it's top secret. Yeah. Uh, and shall I read the next one from Ashley Bell in Sale? Oh, I think you should, yeah. And then you've got the last one coming up. How's that? Great. Hi, Jamie and Richard. How are you? Okay? Ooh, yeah, pretty good, thanks. Uh, I'm fine, thanks. Oh, sorry, Says, I forgot to ask. Yes. How are you, Ashley? Rude. I'm fine, thanks. Phew. 
Uh, just thought I'd write an email and tell you what exciting news I found out. On August the 4th, a Friday, well, I went to bed, but the bad news, I could not get to sleep. Happens. So I got up and went to watch some late night TV. Also so, happens. Channel hopping to find out what's on until I come across CNN, a US news channel. Yes. CNN had a top news story about Voyager 2 space probe that was launched back in 1977. Remember that? I, I wasn't around, but uh, no, so sure. no. Sorry. Uh, no, I can't remember, says Ashley. Oh. Answering his own question there. Mm. Anyway, sat watching this top news story from CNN, it said that NASA hears the Voyager 2 signal has been lost. <gasps> I sat there and thought, wow, Voyager 2 still going after all this time. So my question is this to NASA. If the signal is lost, how do you get it back? I hope NASA listened to the Jerry Anderson podcast. That brings me to my second question ah. about Space 1999. It's about an episode called Voyager's Return, one of my favourite Space 1999 episodes that I have on my YouTube channel. Was that Space 1999 episode Voyager Return based on Voyager 2 space probe, Jamie? I'd like to know. From Ashley Bell, Sale, Manchester. Right. Answer? There's two questions there. There are. The first one, how do you find a lost signal? Yes. I mean, I think they just look for it, right? Okay. You know, they do the things with the big dishes and Ooh, dip around and nice. go, oh, can we hear you? Yeah, yeah. As for Voyager 2 being something for Voyager's return, I have no idea. I mean, I mean it launched post year two ah, right. so but maybe it was but the thing in development for a long time like yeah. the James Webb Space Telescope was in yeah. development for years and years and years so yeah. maybe exactly no, another one for Chris Dale right gosh we really should get him around the table more often yeah because it turns out I actually don't know anything no, and, and, I, and I never and, profess to knowing anything no, so. no, so. yeah I hope that's useful yeah <laughs> go on next one and the oh, last sorry. one that's right sorry 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 uh, this is from Kosh, mm -hmm. who says, Kia ora, Jamie, Chris and Richard. Uh, no thanks, I've just had a coffee. Oh, very good. Is that, is that a bit offensive? I don't know. Why? No, no, I'm not joking. <laughs> no. Uh, uh, he's, he loves the podcast. Anyway, good, Kosh good. Does. So, yep. uh, a funny thing happened at the airport today. Right. That's from Kosh. Yes. Uh, no, of course, uh, while travelling from Cairns, Australia to New Zealand... I went through the e-passport section, yeah. but as I was wearing my Virgil and Thunderbird 2 t-shirt, other shirts are available, available, but why would you have anything other than the Thunderbird 2 t-shirt? Right. The automatic camera system picked up Virgil's face <laughs> right. rather than my own. It didn't match the passport, so I had to go back to the manual system. Oh, no, really? Yeah. That's is, hilarious. Is this because all picture records of international rescue staff from the organisation are top secret? Yes. I think it could be. Yes. Uh, keep up the good work. I'm about three weeks behind on the pod, Oh. Uh, but the dog will just have to go on a few extra walks uh, this week so I can catch up. <laughs> All the best from the other side of the world, and that's from Kosh. Thank you, Kosh. Amazing story. I like that. <laughs> yes. Yeah. International rescues, yeah. Uh, individual identities remain safe. Yeah. Thanks to vigilant passport uh, e-gates. Yeah. Thank goodness for that. <laughs> uh, if you have anything in your brain that you wish to express in an email form, might I direct your fingers to your keyboard? <laughs> where okay. you might type in the address podcast at jerryanderson.com and then no I'm just doing an abridged version and then just write what you want to write and then send it Phew. and I might read it out or Jamie might read it out next time I might try I can't promise to do it with any uh, accuracy yeah. or skill but yeah. I'll certainly try That's thank right. you uh, yes all for now uh, but plenty more next week and also yes. don't look so uncertain no yes, I'm just next thinking week, what's coming ahead later on we'll be yeah. hearing from our podstrons again yes. because we'll be heading on over to the official podstron a listeners Facebook, Facebook group, group. Yeah. Uh, to see what they've been up to there. Can't wait. They're always so lovely there. They are lovely. Mm. And uh, I wonder how Alex Patrick got on with his uh, review of uh, Thunderbirds, which I think is probably finished by now because I think he was hoping to have it done by last month's uh, Yeah, he did the, he did the last episode yeah, last week, right. didn't he? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So what, yeah, but, what would he do next? Yeah, what would he do next? That's right. Space Precinct, maybe. I'd love to, someone to do a, a, an in-depth look at uh, you know, some Space Precinct episodes. I bet you would. Let us know what you think. Yeah. Okay, let's see about that. Anyway, what's happening now? Well, I think it's time to introduce this week's special guest, which means I have to hand over to Chris Dale. Our guest today knows all about living in the amazing worlds of Jerry Anderson because he helped to create some of them. As a model designer, he worked on the 2004 film of Thunderbirds and, more importantly, with a certain anniversary over the horizon, helped to bring the vehicles, craft and characters of Terror Hawks to the screen. Ladies and gentlemen, it's John Lee! 
So John, welcome to our top secret podcast base here at the Moxie Hotel in Slough. Thank you for joining us today. Um, lots of questions to get through here, what with the 40th anniversary of Terror Hooks on the horizon. Mm -hmm. But let's go back to the beginning with, well, how did you first get started in the film industry? So I grew up watching Jerry and Sylvia shows in the 60s and early 70s, and it played a big part of my childhood. I was always making things. I built Airfix kits. I did Meccano. I did all those things, working in a tactile world. I was interested in science fiction, and I loved the work of Ray Harryhausen and people like that. So uh, I had a passion for it. I could draw. I could paint. Uh, through school, I went through the sort of art pathway. So my plans were to be a graphic designer, illustrator, something like that. But in my spare time, I was always making things always watching Jerry's shows and uh, putting my own slant on things. And uh, with a friend, Steve Woodcock, who also, funny enough, worked on Terror Hawks, we started making our own uh, films and miniatures with a view to trying to get into the film industry somehow. Uh, of course, in those days, there was no infrastructure. There were no colleges or universities. So it was a case of you know, finding out who worked in the industry, making contacts, networking. Uh, so basically, I put together a showreel portfolio, met a couple of people who had worked with Jerry in the 60s and 70s, and through that uh, ended up working at Cosgrove Hall Films in Manchester uh, on a series called Wind in the Willows. Uh, and that was very kindly, uh, you know, suggested through Alan Perry, who was one of the directors and uh, cameramen on... Uh, at Century 21. So uh, Cosgrove Hall was my first job on Wind in the Willows and I was a member of the Fanderson uh, uh, fan club at the time and I went to the very first convention in 1981, I think, in Leeds. I think that was the very first con convention. And through reading the magazines, realised at some point that uh, Jerry had a new series in production and at one point I believe I read in a fanzine that it actually started production at Bray Studios. would have been about June or July 82, I read that, and uh, basically picked up the phone and rang Bray Studios and got put through to Mary and asked them if they were looking for model makers on Terrorhawks and she said yes they were. And the rest is sort of history. That's fantastic. I was watching a, a <laughs> clip from um, Wind in the Willows the other day. I'd forgotten how beautiful that series is. Yeah, it was a it was a great series. I you know I was a big fan of animation, as I said. You know Ray Harryhausen and all those kind of fantasy films. So to be working in Manchester, fairly close to home at the time, I'm from Yorkshire. Uh, it was a big thrill. It was a family family business working on a really special TV series. Mm. So did the Anderson shows, were they, obviously they were a favourite, were they like the favourite amongst all these other things? I think they were. I think, I think they were. I mean, Thunderbirds was my favourite series. I've got very strong memories of watching them as a repeat in the 1970s when I was a young teen, uh, rushing home from school, watching Thunderbirds at 4.25 watching them for the perhaps that was the second time I'd seen them you know prior to first viewing it brought back so many fond memories uh sequences from pit of peril and you know Ed, end of the road path of destruction all those kind of things yeah that was my passion the work of you know Jerry and Sylvia and ob and obviously Derek Meddings because I was interested in making things and I was interested in special effects yeah, there's some wonderful visual images in Thunderbirds, particularly that just stay with you forever. So you claim to be um, quite, quite fond and quite well versed in the Anderson shows. We're going to put that to the test right now okay. with a little game that we call Super Identification. We're going to play you uh, a series of very quick, and they are quick, um, clips from introductions to each of the Anderson shows. And you have to tell us when you recognise one, shout it out. We keep scores on which of our guests nice. know the most, um, ranging from, I think, Lee Sullivan is the highest um, grossing um, winner at the moment. Um, you've only got to beat one or two points to not be on the bottom. So are you ready to uh, embark I, on your yes, super identification? Uh, yes. So, right, here we go. Yes. Apologies, listeners and viewers. Let's see how this goes. Okay, let's give it a whirl. Uh, Twizzle. 
Uh, Torchy. Uh, four Feather Falls. Yep. Two Big R. Oh, we're doing well so far. Uh, oh, Fireball. Stingray. Thunderbirds. Seven already. Captain Scarlet. Joe 90. Mm -hmm. uh, Secret Service. Oh, he's doing well. UFO. Uh, protectors. That's one that sometimes tricks people. Uh, Space 1999. This is an American <laughs> Uh, Dick Spanner, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, that was Space Precinct. A place of legend, fabled right across the universe. That's a, that's a Costco of Horse series. I'm not sure. A uh, new Captain Scarlet. That's right. Well, John, that was an exceptionally good performance there on your super identification. <laughs> I can officially tell you that you've scored. 17, 17 out of a possible 18. Um, there's your little person there to uh, enjoy as you Thank see you fit. So much. The one you didn't get, you were right, it was Cosgrove Hall. That was Lavender Castle. Lavender Castle. Yes. I couldn't spit it out. Yeah, yeah it's uh, another one that often trips people up. So okay. did that bring back any memories of seeing those again, even yeah, though they were very it, brief? it did. I mean, uh, obviously, some of the early shows, Stingray, I was still watching that in black and white when it first came out, and probably Thunderbirds was black and white. Uh, but then in the 70s, everything was colour. Uh, yeah, Thunderbirds particularly, you know, racing home from school on a bike to get home by 4.25, you'd often miss the 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, and maybe you'd oh. come in and it would just be horrendous. That was the... <laughs> You've got to get the, the full theme tune. The That's part theme. of the show. So presumably Thunderbirds was the favourite in the Anderson shows. Yeah, I think, yeah. for me it was the favourite, and I, I, I think it's the best show he... And Sylvia made. Mm. Yeah, it really holds up uh, extremely well. And uh, so on the vehicles front, what was your favourite vehicle, whether a regular or, or guest? Well, I, I, loved the, I loved the Thunderbirds main craft. Uh, I had the toys as well. Thunderbird 2 was, my, I think, my favourite. Uh, so I've got very fond memories. They're baked into my, my brain. Uh, I have some of the you know, pieces at home on a, on a shelf... The guest vehicles in the show, uh, the one I remembered, which came flooding back, was the, I think it's the Sidewinder from Pit of Peril, mm -hmm. the vehicle that walks. The music that accompanied that was very, uh, very exciting. Path of Destruction, the Crab Logger vehicle was another big favourite. Yeah. Uh, the Eddie Houseman vehicle, uh, that I think is my favourite episode, End of the Road. Uh, I love that whole sequence, the fact we've got two Thunderbird vehicles assisting in the, re the, the, the help, you know, the recovery. Uh, it was just really exciting. Uh, and it was all, all models. It was all kind of believable, even though I knew they were models. Yeah. It, they were done so well. Yeah, you don't question for a moment that they no, aren't real. No. So um, you go from watching the shows as a kid to some 15 or a bit more later years, um, you're now working on one. Yeah. What was the experience of walking in there and actually realising, oh, you're working on the next generation of the shows that you've grown up watching as a kid? Well, this is a big question. So, uh, well, I'd been at Cosgrove Hall, so I'd had an introduction to the kind of professional workplace. So I wasn't coming in entirely green. Uh, but nevertheless, you know getting the phone call from Bob Bell saying that I'd actually got the job was uh, something I'll never forget. Uh, and him asking me when I could start. I think I started about two weeks later after the phone call. So I had a lot of kind of sorting out to do, where am I going to live, all that kind of thing, moving down to uh, sort of uh, the Bray area. Uh, Getting, getting the letter, getting the phone call was uh, and still is something I can't quite put into words because it meant so much at the time. 
Uh, still does. Uh, it meant so much. It was suddenly, oh, right, okay, my work is good enough to be taken seriously. Uh, someone's going to give me a job, someone's going to pay me to do this work, which I love and still do. I've never deviated from that dream, uh, which I think is important to say. It was it was just truly unbelievable. I couldn't believe it. And of course, myself and my friend Steve, we both got the job at the same time. We came down together on the train. We stayed in digs together for the first few weeks until we could find our footing. We thought naturally that we were not going to be good enough. We had terrible imposter syndrome as people still do now, you know, occasionally projects I take on. I, I think, really, can I, can I really do this? I think that's natural, but very quickly it became evident that actually it was working and we were working quickly. We knew what we had to make, we knew the aesthetic, we knew what it had to look like and that was a you know, that was a big sort of uh, thing in our advantage. And lots of the crew were fairly young, like we were. So it sort of, yeah, I'm deviating from the question because it's such a no, big, no, it's, it's, it's a all, massive question. It's all good stuff, yes. Uh, it's just uh, felt just surreal when I told my friends, when I told my family at the time, it was, what? And of course, you're now working with yeah. names that you would have yeah. seen on the end credits of Absolutely. all of the Thunderbirds and, and Scarlet and so on. So the reality of working on an Anderson show was overwhelming to a certain extent, but also fulfilling, presumably? Well, yeah, both. Yeah. Both. I mean, uh, exciting. It was a dream of mine to work on a Jerry Anderson TV series, and I fulfilled that dream. And I say to lots of you know, colleagues now, young people that I work with, you know, you, you have to have dreams. It's really important, especially in the creative industries. You have to think big. You have to be realistic, nevertheless. You can't just think, oh, I can, I'm going to have a go at model making. You know, you have to be able to do the job. Uh, you have to be realistic, but you have to dream. And th the reason is, if you don't dream, there's never any chance it will happen. Uh, but if you dream and think, well, one day this could happen if I do this, you create your own journey towards making that dream a possibility. And working with friends and colleagues helps. Networking, definitely. You, you can't do this on your own. But you have to dream. Uh, and I, I just think that's really important. Mm. So you mentioned several iconic Thunderbirds moments there. Mm. And when we contacted you and asked for your first Anderson memory, I yeah. believe you gave us like half a dozen possible candidates. <laughs> but the one we've chosen to play you now doesn't involve vehicles as such. Right. It involves uh, a couple of iconic Thunderbirds characters, one of whom, wow. in a, uh, shall we say, is up to his neck in trouble. Shall we play that clip? Please and, do, uh, yeah. Yes. See what you think of this. <laughs> It's no use. He must have got them, too. Uh, if only I could get to the radio. What would you do then, my friend? <laughs> Inform your friends at International Rescue? No, that is out of the question, I'm afraid. Where are the others? What have you done with the others? I shall deal with them later. But first, I want some information from you. Where is the treasure concealed in the underwater temple? Uh, water. I, I've got to have some water. Answer my question. I saw you come from the temple with some of the treasure. Where is the rest of it? I uh, don't know who you are, but please let me have some water. Tell me where the goal is, and then I shall let you and your friends go. It is a simple choice to make. Oh, poor brains. Yeah. Yes, that scene still gets to me even now, because yeah. he's not one of, like, he's not one of the Tracy brothers. Somehow it would feel better if it was one of them buried up to their, their <laughs> yes. necks in sand. But because he's, like, the innocent scientist, <laughs> it's more affecting somehow. Yes. yeah, yeah. 
So was that as as uh, impactful as you remember? Well, yeah. I mean, it's that thought. I mean, Brains was a great character. All the all the Thunderbirds characters were astonishingly well devised and written. Uh, they were so kind of diverse as well, but Brains particularly. The fact that he's buried up to his neck in sand. We've all done that on the beach. We've all been in the beach and we've we've dug a hole and sat in the sand and we've and we felt that compression on our chest. So I knew what he was feeling. His lips are all charred. You know, we've all had that feeling as well. He hasn't got his glasses on, so he looks different. He looks vulnerable because that his specs were his that were his his trademark. The blinking, which wasn't always evident in, in the other shots, you know, it was and you know the hood standing there, towering above him, it's just yeah, it's just really good, a really good sequence. Mm. And is one of the few sequences where the hood is like genuinely menacing. Yeah. It's not just this yeah. comedy knockabout character yes. that he sometimes was. So going back to Terror Hawks, um, what's the, the the first model or building or whatever that you can remember actually working on? So we started. Uh, we started. I started uh, in September. 82 and production had just got underway and uh, Nick Finlayson was the workshop supervisor so we met Nick and the very first thing I worked on was the White House miniature which was under construction. It was a very small scale model and I was making parts for that uh, and very quickly went on to make the interior part of the house that opens up showing all the detailed pipe work, which was all kind of uh, self-designed. There were no drawings for that. So that was one of the reasons I was employed on the show was because I could sort of freeform uh, design and build as I went along. So the White House was the first model. I was shocked at how small it was. Uh, and, you know, at the time couldn't quite perhaps appreciate that the stage was smaller, the workshop was smaller. Uh, so, yeah, that was the first thing I worked on, followed closely by the Mars base, which was used in the first episode, the Mars base, uh, when Ian Schoons was still the visual effects uh, director. Yeah, so I noticed with um, some effect shots in Terror Hawks, not many, but there's a few times, you see bits or remnants of Space 1999. There's the um, Space 1999 moon, one of the moon props um, from Space 1999 was employed, but there's also a section of what looks like Eagle Transporter on the side of Space Hawk. Was there a lot of sort of bric-a-brac scrounging kind of going on to, or scavenging rather, to, well, to there make this was, happen? Well, uh, there was, when we arrived at Bray, there was a space above a staircase in the workshop, and above that staircase, covered up, was that section of the... Uh, Eagle Transporter, which was one of the girder sections. And we didn't think much of it at the time. And it ended up being used in that Space Hawk sequence. Uh, the gun that you see in front of that was something that I made, along with other close up sections of, you know, various bits of vehicle. I don't recall there being that many other X Anderson props and models. Prove me wrong, I don't know. I, I do remember that. that I, I remember the moon, mm -hmm. which I think was split in two. It had a earth painted on one side and the moon surface painted on the other, I think. So um, what sort of input did you have into the design of each model? And did you ever have ideas that you felt, well, oh, this is, this is really good, and then people were like, oh, maybe not, well, we've got this we're going to do instead? Yeah, there was, uh, well, obviously all the main craft were designed by Steve Begg. He came on as a designer initially and then moved up to special effects uh, director. So most of the main, well, all the main craft were designed and they were patterned by various members of the model making team, mainly Peter Tilby, who was a pattern maker. And they were farmed out and brought back as fiberglass sections and then assembled by the model making team. But all the guest vehicles, uh, you know, the Overlander, well, actually Steve designed the Overlander as well, but various guest vehicles close-up sections that were no designs really as such. There were sketches. There were thumbnail sketches done by either Steve Begg or Gus Ramsden at the time. And we were left pretty much with a kind of free-form, uh, 
you know, we, we'd speak to people about, well, how big were the miniatures? How big did it have to be? Could it be light? Was it going to be heavy? Did it have to be pulled along the ground? So there'd be that kind of conversation. But we were pretty much left to it. Uh, there was no time, really, to create drawings for every single vehicle or set. So they relied on having the, the crew uh, able to kind of slot into those particular skill sets. I would imagine in the early days, there's probably a lot of activity and no real time to to go into too much detail. Um, we are going to play yeah. a clip now from the very first episode of the show right. featuring a, a, a building you have mentioned earlier. This is the the Mars base, the NASA Mars base that nice. opens the uh, the very first episode of the show. So let's take a look at that. Great. Planet Mars. A small step for us, but a large step towards mankind. Terrahawks. One of the alien ships is approaching our base. We are transmitting the following message in all Earth languages. We are an unarmed geological base. Our purpose here is peaceful exploration of this planet. stuff so that's zelda making her presence known in the very first uh, scene of terror hawks in fact uh, what do you remember of, of of shooting that that sequence uh, i remember everything about that so uh, the zelda ships were essentially sketches that steve Begg had done as a storyboard and they were given to myself and steve woodcock to build uh, peter bahanna made the central hub section he had experience in fiberglassing and casting which i didn't at the time so Peter made the initial hub, and myself and Steve uh, ended up making, we ended up making uh, 12 Zelda ships. We ended up making an initial six that were never shot. Uh, and then we ended up making the six which feature in the episode. Uh, and we just basically were told they're about two and a half feet long each. Off you go. I made three, Steve made three. They were made very quickly using acrylic and plastic and EMA section and they were mounted on rods and shot very similar to how Brian Johnson shot the effects on Space 1999. The Mars base was looked really good actually in that mm, clip. It still uh, that holds was, up, yeah. Yeah, that was one of the very first sequences we saw being shot. Uh, shot at high speed, obviously, all the barrels rolling towards the camera. Uh the lighting on that looked really nice. Harry Oakes did a great job. Obviously, he's a you know a genius. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, all of that comes back. The close-up section of the Mars base, which myself and Steve made in the evenings, uh, because why would you want to go home if you're working <laughs> on a show like that? Yeah. Naively. Uh, so we made that in the evenings with wax sections, which exploded. Uh, Mark Harris helped out with some of that. Mm -hmm. uh, so we, uh, yeah, that all comes back, uh, and it's a great sequence. It's uh, it's unusually dramatic for Terror Hawks. Yeah, it's yeah. a strong opening. So how did it feel when you've constructed something, and it's going onto the set, and it's got to be destroyed? Is there some part of you that sort of went, "Oh, my baby," or you're like, "Can't oh, blow it up," or <laughs> was it somewhere in between? <laughs> this is a question that everybody asks. I'm generally quite happy when things go up in flames. You know, uh, for me, I. I love the process of making things, and if I get a chance to design things, it's even better. I love the process of, of creating. I love the process of being on set, helping with the filming or, or being part of the filming. And, you know, I love watching it all these years later. So, I, I can, you know, when it, when it blows up into pieces or comes back to the workshop damaged, 
as things regularly did, such as the Overlander and various craft, you just fix them and they go back and you move on to the next thing. So you, you, you're you kept busy all the time. Mm. Uh, well, the Overlander, I, I imagine, was a frequent visitor to the workshop, yes. of which we will get to okay. uh, in part two of our interview. But we're going to move on to now uh, some questions from our podcast listeners. <laughs> You're on this thing. Oh, there we go. Right. In our special, that, I've managed to work it, yes. It's uh, our special Space 1999 lunchbox there, featuring questions sent in by our Podster on listeners. So if you'd like to dig oh, in. So I dig in. And just yes. Actually... So these are real questions. These are from real questions from real listening. people. We vetted all of them, yes. So this is from Alex Pass. Hello, Alex. Hi, Alex. <clears throat> it's the obvious question which is probably why I'm asking it but did he expect people to still be talking about him about ter- did he expect people to still be talking to him about Terrorhawks 40 years later the, the truth is no probably mm-hmm. no I didn't and it's very nice that people are and uh you know I'm very grateful uh it still means a lot in my career uh, so hopefully that answers your question Alex uh also, cheeky bonus question. Oh. Is there a particular vehicle or set he'd like to give a 21st century makeover? <laughs> oh, that's a good one. That's a good question. Well, some of the main craft, you know, they were repurposed slightly for the Thunderbirds feature film, which I worked on. Oh, right. I think, uh, I think there's always a kind of inkling to try and do something slightly different but the same. Yeah. Maybe some of the Thunderbirds craft. Hmm. Although, no, thinking about it, I'm going to change my mind. Yeah. Leave them alone. Yeah. <laughs> so, Alex, the answer is no. Leave them alone. Oh, not even a 21st century overlander. No, leave them no. alone. They were, they were of their time. Mm. That's, that's fair one. enough. Yeah, yeah, please dig in. Help yourself to another one. <laughs> this question is from Steve Bushell. Hello, Hello Steve. Steve. A great chap. Apart from... How do you stay looking so young? <laughs> what, <laughs> what part of model making do you find the trickiest or most tedious? Well, thanks, Steve, for your question. It's moisturiser, basically. Keep moisturising. <laughs> That's in the second half of the interview. Yeah, yeah we'll yeah. get on to that. Uh, what part of model making do you find the trickiest or most tedious? Sometimes the trickiest thing is where do I start? Because you might have a sketch, a loose sketch, or you might have a very detailed blueprint of what you're making. So first of all, there are two starting points. Uh, One of them involves a lot of creative decisions about what should this look like ergonomically and creatively. The other question is, how do I make the end result? Where do I start and how do I make it? So there are two trains of thought. Sometimes having a drawing, an accurate working drawing, is sometimes easier for me because I know what I've got to make and I can just get on with it. If I've got an element of design, then I've got to think about what I'm doing because I'm then trying to work creative, creatively. So uh, usually it's getting started. Which, What am I making? Have I got creative freedom or am I, is this what it has to look like? Mm-hmm. So occasionally I might speak to an art director or a designer and go, okay, you've given me this drawing. Is there any is there any room for manoeuvre? You know, I've got three weeks to make this or two weeks. And often it's, yes, there's room for manoeuvre or no, this is what it has to look like. So those kind of conversations would happen. So usually Fantastic. starting off is the most difficult. Mm-hmm. And, and obviously making sure you stay on track because the thing about working professionally in the industry is there is a start date and there is a, a date at which point it's going to be on set being mm. shot and and that generally doesn't change if anything that time frame moves closer it never right, extends yeah. so the big difference between people that make models for fun and for enjoyment is that there are no time restraints yeah so uh, sometimes i i yearn for that but actually i'm always really happy to work in the kind of commercial world where you have deadlines, and I, I think that's important. Yeah. It keeps you fresh. Absolutely, yeah. So we have time for one more one question from our little box for this uh, half of the interview. Shall I pick this one? Oh, it looks quite, quite a big one. This is from Hugh Porter. Hi, Hello, Hugh. Hugh. If you can, 
What would be some advice you can give to anyone who wants to become a professional in model making for film and television? Good question. Uh, well, you have to you have to be able to make models. That's the first thing. You mm -hmm. have to understand what model making is. So I recommend you know reading lots of books, speaking to people who are model makers and who are designers and makers, and having a go. Just make things, photograph them. Uh, and research your dreams. Uh, does that answer the question? Is that I think it does, yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. the only way. And he's got a quick, another sneaky, quick oh, question. Oh, they're very sneaky this also, week. Also, what would have been the best decision you have made in your career so far? <laughs> what would be the worst so far? Oh. Oh, this is a Is that one you really want to talk about? Shall we leave that for later? <laughs> uh What's the best decision? Coming on the Jerry Anderson podcast, obviously. Well, yes. yes. That, shall we that leave was, it there? Yes. That's, that's, yes, that's, absolutely. That's well done. Thank well, you. Well, thank you very much for those. Um, we'll be returning to our Space 1999 lunchbox next time. But for now, we're going to bring things up to date with a trailer for something that we worked on a bit more recently from oh, Terrorhawks. Right. Oh, okay. Um, yes, this is a trailer for a film, which I, to my shame, have not seen. I hear good things. <laughs> Sam Bell reporting to Central. Everything running smoothly. Over and out. Rock and roll. God bless America. Good morning, Sam. Do you want me to cut your hair then? Lunar Industries remains the number one provider of clean energy worldwide due to the hard work of people like you. Papa Sam has no Three years is a long haul, you know. I know you're really lonely up there, but I'm proud of you. Two weeks to go, Sam. Two weeks to go, buddy. I'm going home. Looks like we got a live one. I'm gonna go out. Okay, Sam. Leaving Serang working perimeter. Do you take anything, sort of any inspiration from the Anderson shows onto your current projects or is it very much what you what you find when you get there? So Moon, uh, we I was I'd been doing a lot of work with Bill Pearson, who was a special effects model maker. Uh, many people know his work and uh, over the years working with him on many feature films, AVP, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. And I was working at Shepperton Studios on uh it could have been Thomas the Tank Engine. I'm not sure what the series was, but I knew that Moon was in production because I'd seen the full size set uh, being constructed. And Bill, uh, Bill was making props initially on that, making a spacesuit, and then he managed to get the contract to make the miniatures. So he pulled together a team of about six people, myself included, and we set up in Bill's small workshop building the miniatures for that film, uh, working with Gavin Rothery and Duncan Jones. Uh, it's a great film, really good memories. Uh, we worked incredibly hard on that film over a really short period of time. I believe, off the record, the miniatures were built in roughly nine weeks, uh, give or take, and the model unit shooting, which was directed by Duncan once he'd shot the live action, was shot in about 11 days Ooh. on a, a stage at Shepperton. So I was building miniatures. A lot of it was designing and building as we went along again, although there were designs for the rovers. Everything else was basically uh, freeform. And we were, I was also on set pulling models through shots and setting up to camera. So, uh, yeah, great memories, really good film. I've got fond memories of that film. I love the movie. Uh, it's, it's fantastic. I have to check that out. Oh, now that klaxon means that it is time for our quick fire five round. Oh, um, no time to explain what this is. <laughs> Just got five questions for you. So here we go. I'm bracing myself. <laughs> Easy one to start with. Terrorhawks Hudson or Thunderbirds Fab One? Fab One. Okay. Bit harder. Sidewinder or Crab Logger? Oh. Crab Logger. Crab Logger. Okay. Sorry. You had to think about that one. Who would you rather have on your side in a tight spot? Lady Penelope or Kate Kestrel? <laughs> Come on, this is serious. Lady Penelope. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Who would win in a fight? Stingray's Titan or Thunderbird's The Hood? Oh, The Hood. Okay. 
Now, the most important question of all, you've been invited to become a Spectrum agent in Captain Scarlet, so you must choose your color from the Dulux range of paint colors. Are you Captain Desert Wind or Lieutenant Frosted Steel? <laughs> Come on, this is serious. I, I think I'm probably Desert Wind. <laughs> Le, Le, oh, Captain Desert Wind. Okay, well, that uh, brings... Because you'd remember Desert Wind. <laughs> you would, yes, yes. That's got a nice sound to it. Well, I hope you'll, despite that, I hope you'll be back next week to uh, talk to us some more about Terror Hawks and other things. Definitely. De yeah, okay. <laughs> why, why not? Why not? You're stuck here anyway. Ladies and gentlemen, John Lee. Thank you. Thank you. John Lee. Oh, Chris Dale. Uh, no, but John Lee. Chris Dale is here every week. I know, but Chris, Chris doing the interview. Uh, I Chris did the interview, but John Lee. Yes, John Lee was lovely. But he was there for Terror Hawks. He was. Bless John Lee. What yeah. a nice man. Yeah. But also bless Chris Dale. Well, yes, but also, you know, John Lee is here as a special guest. Chris is always here, right. so let's not pick him up too yeah. much. Oh, Chris, yeah, yeah. Well, exactly. Uh, yeah. Old Arid Ears, as you called him a few weeks back. Did I call him that? You did. I can't believe that. And I'm saying that now because he's in the room. And right. that might be the first time he's heard that. Yeah. Old arid ears, yeah. Anyway, no, he's, he doesn't, he doesn't care. <laughs> anyway, Chris will be back next week with the second part of his interview with uh, with John Lee. And how do you feel about Chris taking over the... Uh, Love well, it. what's your interview slot now, really? Well, he's never, he isn't. I've just done it because you haven't been available. But Chris <laughs> stepped in because I've had enough. OK, very all right. <laughs> I'm joking, Well, well done, Chris. Very good job. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, so, uh, second part of that interview next week. In the meantime, let's head over to our Facebook group because people have been commenting on uh, facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash podstrons. Alex Patrick has continued and probably by now, as we mentioned earlier, uh, who did his review of all episodes of Thunderbirds. As you might expect, it's been full of highs and lows, which prompted Simon White to observe... All of this comes back to a point that I made in my review of Space Precinct Unmasked, which I posted in a listener's email some time ago. In it, I said that it's important to remember to take off the rose-tinted glasses and acknowledge that nothing's perfect. Mm. And even those shows in the legendary tier have more than their fair share of subpar episodes, uh, plot holes, head scratches, etc. And this is something that the commentary in the randomizer makes abundantly clear. This is the same for all long-running series and franchises with multiple iterations, spin-offs, etc. For example, Example. Trekkies will have an absolute field day picking apart Voyager and Enterprise, but regard the original series as the Holy Grail. And there were some pretty bad episodes of the uh, original series, such as Shaw Leave and Spock's Brain, etc. Another example would be how people react to the Michael Bay iterations of both Transformers and Ninja Turtles, mm. but seem to forget that the 80s iterations of both those shows were far from perfect and were ultimately made with the goal of getting kids to buy the toys associated with them. True. Yes. Yeah. Just big, elaborate toy adverts, basically. Absolutely right, which you can never accuse the Jerry Anderson series of being. No. Absolutely not. Never. However... I think it's only right and fair to acknowledge that perhaps you can't get it right every time. No, absolutely not. Yeah, no, fair enough. Isn't any, it? Of, any of the shows are perfect. I'm sure there are some episodes of the Jerry Anderson podcast which might be regarded as subpar in uh, some sense. I can't imagine that. I mean, <laughs> all very similar level, I think. Well, why don't we ask the Podstrons? Let us really? know which you think then was the no, worst episode no. of the Jerry Anderson podcast. <sighs> Go on, read out another that's, Facebook that's post. That's dangerous I know. What, whichever guest appeared on that episode, uh, well, isn't it? Well, it won't be about the guest, will it? It might be. Oh, gosh, I'm regretting it now. Yeah. Sorry. Okay, thanks for that. <laughs> uh, Nick Reese. Oh, yes. Has been writing on the Facebook group. Good. It says, here's a random Anderson-related Sunday musing. Oh, great. I must have written on a Sunday, I Possibly, assume. Possibly, yeah. Being a child of the very late 60s, I first caught UFO on the ATV Sunday lunchtime repeats. I was a fan. Hmm. Also, at that time, I was a fan of the BBC children's show, Mary, Mungo and Midge. Oh, I used to love Mary, Mungo and Midge. Which I've never seen. Oh, it's lovely. No, well, I'll take your word for it. Yeah. For years, I was convinced that Mary, Mungo and Midge had lifted some music from UFO. Eh? Hmm. In the episode bumch, The bumch, Crane... Bumch, 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 bumch. <laughs> Probably not that one. Oh. Uh, in the episode of The Crane, some percussion is played as Midge climbs up the crane. Right. Um, approximately 8 minutes and 15 seconds into the episode, if you want to check out for yourself. Of that, yeah. To my young ears, it sounded completely the same as the music played in the first scene in Identified, where Peter Carlin, uh, etc., are being chased in the forest by the ufo man. Oh, it's okay. <laughs> the alien, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but <laughs> Nick then reflects, just goes to show how wrong you can be. Oh, so <laughs> okay. All right, all right. Fair enough. I thought something, I was wrong. Absolutely. And that's a very uh, commendable yeah. attitude, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, Ian Stevens posted, I had to have an ECG and blood test today. Don't worry, nothing serious. 
Uh, just having some issues with swelling in my feet, which can be very uncomfortable. Ooh, ouch. Anyway, the chap who did my blood test turned out to be a Jerry Anderson fan. Hurrah! They walk among us. They do. Uh, he was telling me he built a Thunderbird 2 out of material he had available in Scouts and won a competition. He was so proud. Amazing. Naturally, I told him about the group, the podcast, and the fact that he can watch the shows on ITVX, and he was absolutely amazed to hear that there was a Facebook group and a podcast, so who knows, he may join us soon. So I will keep an eye on Louise Everson's weekly Welcome to the Group post to see if his name pops up. Just doing my bit to grow the fan base. Thank you, Ian. That's nice brilliant. Bit. Yeah, it's good. So are you said phlebotomist? <sighs> Uh, yeah, it, it was. It was sort of grabbed by Ian to become yeah. a, a posteron. Yeah, let us know. We'd love to hear from you. That's right. Podcast at jerryanson dot com. And uh, in the subject line, I want to see the subject. I am the phlebotomist. Absolutely, I can't wait to read that email. <laughs> <laughs> Talking of Louise Everson, she asked Terra Hawks fans because, of course, we're slap back in the middle of uh, celebrating ten uh, ten, the fortieth anniversary of uh, Terra Hawks. Mm. Actually, on the ninth of October. Nine ten. Yes, yes, but ten ten. They should have thought about that back in the uh, yeah, she, shouldn't they? Uh, <laughs> she asked Terra Hawks fans, what are your favourite episodes and why? Jonathan Westall says, from the TV series, my favourites are Time Warp, The Ultimate Menace and First Strike. From the audio episodes, my favourites are Time Split, Into the Breach, My Enemy's Enemy and Enemy's Negotiation and Deceit. I think one of the writers might have been in the room there. Yeah, so, just yeah. made his day, I think. Yeah, okay. uh, Michael John says, I love Thunder Roar because of Shram and the appearance of the Overlander. People love the Overlander. Mm. Uh, Jonathan Bell says, my favourite two episodes are Time Warp yep. and A Christmas Miracle. Okay. Interesting. Yep. Uh, Robert Casty likes the ugliest monster of all because he loves Yuri uh, and the way his snout scrunches up when he's using his powers uh, like Paddington Bear eating a marmalade sandwich ah. very simple I'd never thought of the parallel between Yuri and Paddington <laughs> until now yeah yeah and uh, finally Duncan Moss says played against Shram so many jokey homages and Mickey takes just love the Beatles homage big Beatles fan Duncan Moss mm. uh, as well as uh, being great fun the icing on the cake is the fabulous special effects at the end yeah very good that's enough to tempt anyone to watch, isn't it? It's a great it? selection. Then I'm glad that some of the audio episodes made it into people's favourites. Yes, that's right. It's good news, isn't it? Yes. Very good news. Yeah, like yeah. it. Uh, comment on our Facebook group. We'll read them out next time or the time after that. Or the time after that? Yeah. Or the time after that? I don't feel like I've had enough Chris Dale. Really? Of this episode. I've had of quite enough of Chris Dale. Well, today. tough. <laughs> because he's back. Uh, doing what he does best. Uh, Sitting on a sofa, yeah. watching some Jerry Anderson. Right, he's well good at that, isn't yeah. he? Yeah. Uh, let's see what uh, John Lee manages to pull out from the machine, shall we? Uh, yes. Okay, good luck with your randomising, John and Chris. So, John, I feel like we've we've just been talking over there and now we're, we're over here. We have. Doing something we've moved else. Yeah. all the way from there to here. It's a yeah. long way, but yeah. thank you for joining me to press the button on the randomizer today. Thank you. You, of course, know, as everybody does, that this contains every Jerry Anderson episode ever made. Really? And if you'd like to press that button right there, right. it'll tell me what episode I'm going to be watching and commenting on today. Okay, well, here we go. How about it? Oh, sorry, I moved it. That's quite all right. <laughs> So is there anything you're hoping to see come up today? Anything you... Stingray would be good. Stingray, Stingray would be good. Uh, speak of the devil and Never. it shall appear. Not only is it Stingray, it's a very good episode of Stingray indeed. It's time for Emergency Marineville. So we welcome back to the randomizer. It's Stingray. It's a very good episode of Stingray. Um, you've got to say right off the bat, the music is just sensational. As we get our rocket launched, from a, 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 an island somewhere, a form of volcano by the look of it. And um, in the UK broadcast order at least, I, be I believe this was chosen as the second episode to air. So I've always had the sense that certain people at AP Films were always very fond of this episode. Uh, not only because it aired second, but also because it was mined for clips several times um, in the um, Aquanaut of the Year clip show episode and also the reunion party. I have a feeling I might even be missing something else there, but I love the, the pace and urgency of this intro. We don't know who this missile is from, but it's just this wonderful speed of, of the, the Marineville reaction. It also helps to, to really establish that these are you know, real trained military people. Sometimes the, the Stingray characters felt more like a family, uh, a, a bunch of chums, uh, than a, you know, a real military force. Yes, sir. 
And of course, in this episode, not only do we get Stingray, um, which is now being launched. Okay, sound launch stations. Yes, sir. Where do we know that from? Um, there is also, we're going to be sending out the um, Wasp bombers to investigate as well. So it's all going on. It's very serious, uh, very serious response to this unexpected attack. And I love the look of these bombers. Um, interesting colour scheme. I also like that we get Stingray launch and the bombers launch combined into one sequence. It's very, very exciting stuff. <sighs> Good stuff. This is an episode I am sure many people will be very, very familiar with. If you know Stingray, you know this episode. It just, much like The Big Gun, which is another of, well, my absolute favourite um, Stingray episode, it's a simple idea that is realised on such a grand scale, and that is, you know, obviously key to the success of so many of the Anderson shows, but, the, you know, it is just essentially another alien attack story. But the direction, the music, the cinematography, it's all just, um, it just works, it all just gels. Although I've never been keen on, having said all that, I've never been keen on that shot of the three bombers swooping as they take off one after another. And you can see a little tree in the background is just shifting position every single time. Anywho. Beep, 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 beep. Beep, beep, beep. It's time to find the island where the the missile was launched from. Hmm. Now, although I'm sure I would have seen this episode when the BBC repeated it in the early 90s, my abiding memory of it is more for being part of the compilation Invaders from the Deep. Um, I, I just, sorry, I just love that line, you know. There's absolutely nothing there, well, apart from an island, but aside from that, uh, this is cool as well. The planes have gone past, we're waiting, we're waiting, and they're coming back the other way. Again, it's just these lovely touches of realism. Yeah, I was, um, would have seen this most often as part of the Invaders from the Deep compilation movie. And uh, I think Jack Knoll said it in his wonderful Stingray um, blogs that he's been writing recently and has now moved on to the Secret Service, which has been equally good. Um, he said that when, you're, when you've seen the compilations so many times, when you see the episodes uncut, because the, the compilations were made up of 100 minutes of material trimmed down to 90 minutes, so every episode lost some, some bits and pieces. There's nothing here. Doesn't seem to be. Let's talk about how oh, there's nothing here to see. Yeah, yeah um, you do kind of get used to it as the compilation edit. And then when you see the uncut episode, and you're surprised by deleted scenes, well, yes, scenes that were deleted for the compilation, always feel like they should never be there. That's a gorgeous shot. Um, yes. Another missile is gone from the island. Phone said the island was probably uninhabited, sir. It wasn't me, honest. Yes. Again, an, another lightning quick response to the missiles. Yeah. I think this is also the point in the series. I, I mean, I said it was broadcast as episode two. I think it was made as something like episode 11. So everyone's found their feet by this time. And Ray Barrett is just so, oh, heroic commander voice. It's good stuff. Beneath the island. Hmm. The easiest way to enter would be down the crater. Yeah, but we could meet another missile on its way up. Exactly. And we don't have another toy fish to send in uh, for reconnaissance. The there could be another entrance down there. Hmm. What do we got to lose? More, more lovely music here with this episode. Uh, I think, as I've said before, the big gun, being my favourite episode, has my favourite music. All of this music was specially composed for this episode, and this is all good stuff as well. It, it's not got that thing that the big gun theme has, or the giant oysters 
theme or, or others. There's no sort of you know, grand march, it's more a sense of, of urgency and, and of driving action, which works great. And of course it, it turns up in, in other episodes all over the place. I'm trying to work out there, I can't quite see from, from all the way over here, is Marina still sat in her injector tube chair at the back of the, uh, the cabin? Well, okay, we've found a way in to what could be an, an undersea base or lair. Time to investigate. <gasps> Ominous cave music. Again, such a lovely touch. You could have just had Stingray rise in the water, but we are watching it from like the next cave over. Um, and that doesn't look suspicious at all, does it? Strange purple and gold thing. Let's take a look at that tunnel at the far end. Hmm. Marina, you just sit tight. And don't worry about the fact that we've now got our blinking face on and Phones has got his angry face on. It's totally fine. Nothing is going to happen to us. <laughs> or it will instantly happen to them as they run into this security device that um, paralyzes them. Oh, I don't like it. <laughs> oh, now you're jumping to conclusions again, Troy. Oh, but unfortunately... Oh, my arm. I can't move it. Yes, they're slowly being paralyzed. And, of course, this is one of those scenes where characters say that they're being paralyzed. They can... It must be a oh. paralyzing ray of some kind. Come on, come on. I can't move a muscle. <laughs> Let me move my lips as I'm explaining to you how I can't oh, I... move a muscle. But that's, that's on wow, lots of shows. Speak. Oh dear. And you do get the sense as well of how, uh, how uncomfortable this is for them. Again, it's the, the change of expression, the blinking heads and the sweat that adds so much to it. As well as that horrible building sound suddenly cuts to silence. And a little light. It look, almost looks like an ashtray that's been glued to the wall. Welcome to our base, Captain Tempest. You are beneath the island of Baal. Hmm. So we're now in a base beneath the island of, well, I heard it pronounced as Baal. I think it's Baal. If you turn on the, um, the subtitles on the network Blu-rays, it's the island of Baal, which sounds like gross. Oh, information time. I know you are both brave men. Well, thank you very much. Um, aided, but talk, a lovely pair of, of aliens here in uh, Nuchella and Chidora. Oh, big gun music. As we reveal that Nuchella and Chidora have got as their hostage. <laughs> yes, there she is, strapped into a chair, an electric chair by the look of it. I also never noticed until the Blu-rays that they the, the set designers have obviously cut a panel in the wall for Marina's chair to rotate through. And they must have realized late in the game that the puppet's knees were going to cause problems because they've cut a very small additional knee flap just to get the knees through the wall as well. As I turn this control, the electronic power increases. Marina will be quite safe. Until a thousand marine volts are reached, mm -hmm. then she will die. Oh dear, that's no good. Do you hear me? Let her go! Certainly, Tempest, when I have the correct interceptor frequencies. Ah, oh, so I yes, they're trying to... Uh, tell it. Command is sure, Lemon, all the marine will be wiped out. Blackmail Troy and Foes. Into giving them those vital codes. Well, I was also admiring that not only are these gorgeous looking alien puppets, Costumes are gorgeous as well. Three lines even, even down to the little sandals they wear. Oh, that's it. Time to turn on the power. Got lots of blinky lights. 100. 200. Oh no. 300. I also like that so much of the scene goes without music until the very end. It's almost like the hum of the the building electricity is uh, is the music in a way. And poor old Marina, she is really suffering here. Um, it's like 
you know, they, they say the best way to um, to extract pathos from your audience is to threaten a puppy. And I feel to a certain extent Marina is, is much the same, you know. She looks so... Leopard. She's got her blinking head on and sweating, but she's still not giving in. She won't... She won't let them do it. And these puppets, I believe, were reused several times. Uh, almost to the end of the series, they were the lighthouse dwellers. And also, I think... Oh, what's the name of the aliens in um, Deep Heat? Oh, yeah. I, my name is Tarata. This is Fragil. Yes. So they got some use out of these puppets. Ultra 975-50-00-DAC. Damn, Troy, no. He's betrayed everybody. Phones is extra sweaty now. Oh, boy. It's so effective to convey a march to the cell. Just the this exciting dramatic music with this, this pounding beat. Wonderful. Farewell for the present. Yes, beautifully designed aliens who, oh yes, of course, they've left the keys um, to the cell that Troy Phones and Marina are now locked in. The keys have been left oh, not too far away on the table. But yeah, the design of the aliens is interesting as well. Because they've got this sort of grey feathered hair, one of them's got a beard. But they also have what look like miniature diving platforms on their heads. And sometimes you look at the aliens in Stingray and think, okay, that, that works as a you know a, a design for an alien character. But how would that how would underwater life evolve? What purpose does that serve? Uh, it's the same with um, is it Ibran in Treasure Down Below, who appears to be wearing a candelabra on his head. I also like the uh, well, not suggestion, it's the fact, you know, these aliens, they've got to put in a lot of work to destroy Marineville. It doesn't just happen overnight. Right. We've got to keep these rockets so being built, and, you know, keep one on the pad there ready goes. to go, and meanwhile, Troy and Phones now are uh, trying to recover the key by using some uh, cloth from the Missed. bedding. Now, this time, it's going to work. <laughs> well, there we go then. Yes. Uh, they've, they've created a, a rope using material from the bedding and one of Phone's buttons. Because Troy is not going to sacrifice one of his buttons for his own plan. He might make his trousers fall down. He couldn't have that. The weather report is favourable for firing at first night, Lieutenant. Good. The rocket Where do they get their weather report from? Marineville will be destroyed. Oh, good. That's a lovely reading on that line. Nearly there. Nearly got the key, come on. And it's, you know, again, it's an old cliche. Trying to, prisoners trying to recover the key to their own cell. They've nearly got it. Come on, come on. Last chance, and... Oh, he's got them. Because Nichella and Chidora have returned just to have a bit of a gloat. I'm also wondering whether if that floor. I recognise it from later episodes. Not that floor, the uh, exterior. Oh, that'll be nice. Until dawn, then. Good night. Good night. Oh. Wow. Why was that close? I thought sure he was going to lose the gear, though. Me too. I want to take a look at that missile. I'll wait until things quiet down. Then we start. Oh, that's a shot I really like as well. Um, that shot of the moon, I feel that was reused in, in later episodes. I'm also wondering about that little crop on the side of the missile base there. Um, these little sort of spiral cylinder. 
I seem to recall one. that from somewhere. And walls move and we'll all be going to paradise. My brain is yeah, just frazzled with having to keep all of these shows in my head all the time. Still no word from Stingray crew at Atlanta? No, sir. Uh, it's times like this I wish we invested in more than one ship. Oh. Troy and friends have had a busy night. Tinkering with the missile. Yeah, just in time. Missile ready for launch, Lieutenant. Very well. I love that the aliens waited until the next morning, you know, for the most favourable weather report. So that's it. Missile number three is en route for Marineville. Troy and Phones and Marina are going to get a front row seat to the destruction of Marineville. Marineville tracking station calling. Missile approaching. Again, the angles on this. Emergency! Emergency! Fire wasp interceptors! Then got me left. But also, that I, I love with this coming up these interceptors aren't going to stop the missile. And as the guy radios in to say missile is unchecked, you hear the, the missile approaching in the background. There's almost something quite nightmarish about it. I would imagine that this would have resonated with children at the time who perhaps would have um, perhaps had to live through experiences like this in school of, you know, maybe one day the impossible the will happen and we might the be facing a, a missile coming our way. Attention! Attention! There it is. It's just... Oh. Impact. Five seconds. Oh, yes. this is I suppose I should say I love you or, or something. Oh, oh, too late. Again, just beautiful delivery in the dialogue. There's oh, such urgency to it. It didn't explode. Yay. We're okay. Yeah, Tyler. How long? Attention, Marineville. Emergency remains. Rock our disposal squad will get to work on that missile immediately. I want to report as soon as possible. You really feel for a moment that it could happen. Again, just gorgeous music. So loud, so bombastic. I didn't get the impression with that attack, though, that, um, that Marineville went to battle stations and everything went underground. Again, the attention to detail there are the little miniature figures. Uh, Working on the disposal squad. squad. They've been working for hours on that missile. Yes, and at any time we could all be blown sky high. <sighs> oh, wait, here comes the lieutenant. Ah, oh, here we go. Here's some good puppet walking here. Yeah, hold on that. That looks good. The missile is safe, sir. In fact, the warhead had it uh, been disarmed before it hit Marineville. How's that, lieutenant? I think this note will explain, sir. We found it in a red container near the main centripetal contact region. Uh huh. Yeah, Troy, not only. Reprogram the missile. Right. We have it's from Troy. Time to write from them a note. Troy? This note explains that they are prisoners in a base beneath Barl Island. Oh. Say, the old son of a gun disarmed that missile. <laughs> he saved us. Yeah, knowing yeah. Troy, he probably claimed that he managed that single handedly yeah, while phones late. wept quietly in the cell. Again, more gorgeous music, and just. It's the feeling of military might that I, I enjoy so much with. Moments like this in the Stingray, particularly musical moments like this. Who are in these planes? I don't know. Maybe other side pilots. Um, it's just the, the, the grandeur, the pomp. This is important stuff that's going on here. <sighs> but yeah, it does mean that this anonymous pilot gets to save the day. Your prisoners, or we will attack. You have 30 seconds to surrender. They will not attack while we have Tempest and his friends. That's where you're wrong. Every <laughs> that guy doesn't like me very much. If you don't surrender, I guess we'll all die. Again, great, great acting yeah. from, from yeah. all the actors yeah. in this scene, but also particularly Don Mason. Really sells the idea to the aliens, of course, as he must, that uh, Troy believes, actually, you know what, this is the end. They have abandoned Tempest and the others. No. Oh, no, poor, that gorgeous set is now going to be trashed. No, they won't, Mr. Allen. We're all doomed. And it's another beautiful sequence of explosions as this this island goes up in smoke. The pigs, the pigs on fire. They will 
Oh, oh, oh. Kan vi kan gärna göra det. Oh, oh. Kan vi kan gärna göra det. 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 Kan vi kan footage because the island is intact there. Jet squadron spearhead from Stingray, we have been released. Again, I love the way the music continues very quietly. We have a couple just of those, those strings Roger, until the dialogue is finished. Good and then... Oh, I love it. And again, it's such a simple story. Stingray crew held hostage by naughty aliens. We've seen it a million times. It's just... You know, sometimes archetypes are archetypes for a reason. It's because they work, and this is just some gorgeous effects work. And I, I really get the sense that they totally destroy this island. Right? It's just it's chunks of it flying all over the place. Lovely. That's what we want. From island destroys. Returning to Marine Bell. Yay! Yeah, this is a scene in the uh, compilation version that I mentioned earlier. That was where the episode stopped. Sure I think we went on to the big gun from there. So I've never quite I guess we'll have no more trouble. <laughs> accepted job. this little uh, jokey scene on the end wrong, here. Holmes. Where everything's fine, everything's okay. What's, What's the priority? I won't have my men looking suddenly while I'm duty. Phones and his missing button. Missing. Well, oh dear, oh dear. Don't that be off. Yeah, I'm not keen on that ending. It might just be because of the compilation, but even if I hadn't seen the compilation, I don't think I would have enjoyed that ending. But a slightly duff ending does not mean that I didn't enjoy the heck out of Emergency Marine Girl today. That has always been one of my favourite episodes of Stingray, and I suspect that is a very popular one, not only among fans, but with the people who created it to begin with, because they, they earmarked it several times for, for clips, and quite right too, because all the way along the line, the music, the, the model work, the aliens, uh, and the voice acting, it's just, it's one of those episodes where if you were putting someone who'd never seen the show, you sit them down, put an episode on, this is one of the ones that you want to be, um, to, to use to hook them in, so it's no surprise really that this went out second in the UK broadcast order initially, um, despite the fact that we all know Plant of Doom should have gone out second instead of episode 34, but despite that, oh, it's good stuff. It's always good stuff. I, I've always got time for this episode, and today has been no exception. So I do hope I'm not the only fan of Emergency Marineville out there. Do please let us know, because this has always been one of my favourites, and I think it always will be. Very good stuff. Stingray. A very nice choice, John Lee, even though John technically had no control over it. Yeah. But let's say some magic of his work on Terror Hawk spilled over and, and won us a Stingray episode. Yes. Oh, I see. But I thought you meant that somehow the work he'd done on Terror Hawks affected it, the production no, of Stingray. No, You're talking him about with a, some, some sort of special power. power to get us a nice episode. I think it's doubtful. Probably, yeah. That's not how the randomizer works, is it? Don't think so. Good. Right. Well, shall we move on then? Uh, Let's move on to the end, shall we? Because I think you're in need of a quick break and a cup of coffee. coffee. Yeah. You're absolutely yeah, right. I can sense it already. Your nose is starting to scrunch up a bit like Yuri and Paddy's and Bear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's Not a dead cert. Marmalade sandwiches. Oh, that sounds nice. Yeah. Brown bread and real butter. Obviously. Great. Salted. See you next week. Is that it? <laughs> yes. Quick, I'm starving. Okay. Bye. Bye. Let's get started. Let's go. Spectrum is green.
Is that weird to say salted oh. butter with marmalade sandwiches? No, it's that salt and savoury thing. I don't know why people buy unsalted oh, butter. It's like cheese. Unsalted butter's like cheese. Oh, you get those little salt crystals in cheese. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but you know I can't eat cheese now, of course. So. Get, why not? What's happened? I've, no, I, you know this already. What's happened? What have you done? Gradually, over the yeah. last few years, become lactose intolerant. And it's horrible and I hate it. You can't eat cheese. No. Well, I mean, I could be your non-cheese eating support group, if you wish, because I'm not eating cheese, eating cheese anymore either. But is that out of choice, is it? No, it's because of a blood test I had a few weeks ago. Oh, well, it's a, it sort of is a lifestyle It's the old cholesterol it? thing, isn't it? Yeah, well... I get to my age. It's old Got cholesterol. To yeah. I wouldn't say old, just mm, aging, maturing. Like a fine cheddar. <laughs> Salty bits. For a salt crystal. Lovely. Yeah. Mm. OK. Uh, Marmalade sandwich. Yeah, off All we right. go. Come on. Yum. That was an Anderson Entertainment production.